Uh, adjusting a hearing aid. Hello. There it is. Here you are. No, I don't. I have no idea how to use that. Oh. Painting carries all the way through in my almost 30 years of really being a full-time artist. Okay, my name is Marcy Jan Bronstein, and this is the catalog for my show, Being Here, and this is at the Zillman Art Museum in Bangor, Maine, uh, until December 23rd. Being Here is actually the title of this painting, which you'll see um, in the show if you get a chance to go there. I've been uh, a resident of Belfast, Maine for the past 25 years and uh, during that time I've lived and worked in this studio and done many different things. Photography and painting and teaching and designing and bookmaking and full-time art. Hi Marcy. Hey Al. How are you? <laughs> well it's great to be here with you in your studio uh, on Homestead Close here. One of the strangest names for a road I ever knew. But it's okay because we're close here and it's nice to be near each other actually rather than on the fabulously functional Zoom. Marcy, tell me something. Uh, I've asked you this recently, but you know, you've been known, I think, mostly as a photographer mm. over many, many years. Mm. And many people didn't realize that you also painted. Could you tell us a little bit about? your history with painting and photography, how you came to the world. Yeah, well, painting carries all the way through in my almost 30 years of really being a full-time artist. Uh, so I started out as a painting student in New York City. I painted on photographs, so I would paint with wet watercolors on my wet photographic prints. And I learned, uh, I taught myself Photoshop and started working in layers on top of my photographs and painting them. I stayed in the digital darkroom making all kinds of uh, a lot of the photographs that you see in the studio around you. I got the opportunity to work on a cruise ship as a, a painting teacher and that was a little bit of a clerical accident but I felt like I could do it, I could rise up to it and I started, uh, I just dove right into watercolors and I became a, a teacher and for five years, traveled around the world and taught watercolor to students from all over. At first I was just like, I was just going to teach, uh, you know, the principles of watercolor painting. And um, it evolved and I really found my own voice and my own way with the medium and it became, it's just, it became much bigger. It became a kind of way of living. Um, and that sounds a little grandiose, but it's, 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 it can't, it has to be noted that it's in response to so much that is clickable and scrollable and um, reproducible and copies of things. Um, so I just wanted to, to make singular images with my hand, paint on paper. And um, I became a little bit evangelical about that. So. My work is really, it serves me, it puts me in a particular space, painting this way, just as you describe. I'm watching, you have to watch, and with watercolor, everything depends on the bead, that wet bead. And, uh, you know, it can be literally a bead, but it can also be sort of a line, a bead that's a whole line um, at the bottom of a shape or a, a section. And it's mesmerizing to watch that and to interact with that as a kind of communing with the materials. It asks you to really be here and be with it. And that's been a, that's also been a long-standing interest of mine and, you know, yoga practice and breath work and swimming. Like it's, it's, it's really been a kind of perfect storm of my interests in my, my intellectual and my emotional wonderings um, and um, things that I continually constellate around, you know, for, for years and years, it comes together for me in watercolor. And, yeah, that's yeah. That's, so I'm curious, as you say, about your teaching watercolor for the very first time to people who really had no prior experience for maybe for the most part, how, how, how did you approach that whole? Yeah, that's before? a great question. So I had the great fortune just before that gig, I was, 
the art educator, the lead art educator for the Center of Maine Contemporary Art at the Art Lab. And I was, I had spent almost five years developing projects. They had to be fun, cool, material-based, and I, um, projects that anybody could come in all ages and that people could make art or just, you know, mingle with the materials. And I had really five solid years of watching what people think is interesting and fun and compelling. And I treated my, my gig on the cruise ship exactly the same way, knowing that a lot of people were just coming to me for entertainment or for, but there were some people that were very, very serious. So what I did was I straight away, I made it itinerary based. My big passion that was a surprise was I started painting birds. So I have, I have like, I have like almost a hundred that I've done. So these are these birds yeah, all over the world. This is the national bird of whatever country we were in, whichever country. And I, I you know, so people love this. When we went to Australia, they wanted to paint the emu, you know, and they saw my whole collection. So I brought it all along. Yeah. So I would wake, you know, every so national birds of countries I visited. I just did this for fun for myself. And then it became, you know, something that I was passionate about and I just shared it with the passengers and they loved it. We always start with a bead because if you're teaching watercolor, that's lesson one, mm -hmm. no matter what watercolor textbook you open. And so, and everybody really loved that as a starting point. So just pulling the bead down the page mm -hmm. to make a beautiful wash, mm -hmm. that's always the starting point. Sure. So it was a real privilege and an opportunity to be a teacher because one of the things I heard most when I would meet people in other parts of the ship and I would say, uh, I'm the watercolor teacher, come to my class. The, so often people said, oh, watercolor, so unforgiving. Mm. And I got so sick of hearing that word because I felt like it can't possibly be that. We all have seen beautiful watercolors and, um, and I myself, so I really um, started to break it down, which is why I got into the sketchbooks really I broke it down. I, I really wanted to um, account for the behaviors. The watercolor is not just moving over here and there um, randomly. It's, t it's responding to your touch. And so if I was speaking about what you just said, pulling out a bead and creating a channel, which is what the water does, mm -hmm. you're studying flow. And um, it's a really beautiful thing to study. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And you know, maybe we could talk a little bit about the uh, kind of granular mm. uh, colors. Now tell us a little bit about those granular text colors. The beautiful thing is like as you go forward in your whatever your art path is, is materials can point the way, a color can point the way, but in, in this case, you know, a lot of, mm, not so much these, but a lot of the paintings in the show have that me playing with the, the sedimentary colors. Do you ever wake up old colors? you can pull the colors off. You can re-wet, you can pull it off, you can scrub things out, you can add another layer, and that's very often a magical fix-it, is just put another layer of something. The Oasis series, yeah. um, that, uh, that was, uh, it started kind of as a fix, really, is putting a layer on top of another layer, and it grew to a whole series. It seems so, um Middle Eastern in mm, a way, mm. and so much I can see the, the oasis. You would set up your tent in an oasis, and then you'd have all these experiences going in and out of your tent. Mm. And that's what sort of seemed to me, and the title seemed to be, you know, interesting. And I wanted to talk about that. I mean, maybe you could kind of tie those two subjects together. Yeah, really beautiful interpretation of it to take it to the Middle East, to, you know, to take it to the desert. And um, so the titles, the titles in my works are really important and they, they come most often midway or toward the end and it really is a way for me, when you get the right title, you really, it, it, it feels like there's something very complete there and something that you're clarifying. And the Oasis series started with the one in the center called Tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And um, I initially just started that because I loved the color. I had mixed, um, it's, a, it's a mix of two colors. Um, 
a transparent pyrrole orange, and a French ultramarine blue. So I'm mixing orange and blue to create the color in that painting. And I just, as I start all of my paintings, I just touch my brush to the, pa to the paper and go. I don't, no pencil ever on my, ever on my watercolors. Mm -hmm. And no sketches that um, predate and that I figure anything out. So I just started and then I kept building it and it became that veiled, it became that. And I became really excited by what was the port, what was like a doorway or a portal. Mm -hmm. And I really loved that idea that, that actually a painting can beckon to the viewer and, and invite you in, in this other way. And um, so I, I just thought, wow, this painting, it's monochromatic essentially. It's just layers of paint on top of each other. And that, um, it, it, that's where the word tomorrow came to me, that this is kind of the beginning of a new series. They also, I mean, a lot of these paintings have these portals, these openings into a completely blank space. Yeah, so this is my most recent work, and it came after I myself saw finally my show hung, and George Kinghorn did a beautiful job of, of sequencing the show. And when I, I looked at my work, I thought about, uh, you know, I love the idea of playing with the portal, but uh, it, it occurred to me that I could have, if I had two portals, then the viewer would have a choice. Mm -hmm. And so um, I came back and I started making these, but these floating forms um, are really um, a holdover from some paintings I did during the pandemic and germs and things that, and organisms and how biological we all are. It's not, I didn't start it off so literally, but when I started painting these forms that kind of hold on to each other like that, I, I realized in the pandemic that it was something that I could really play with and, and um, work on. This is a painting in progress, and I, I don't know where I'm going with it, but I love to just look at things for a while that are waiting for the next thing to happen. I don't think it's overstating it to say that when you're looking at not even just my painting, but you're seeing my orientation to the world. And um, the, um, somebody, somebody described my, my show and the works in my show as playful, and that's so much of what I'm doing, like a lot of artists, is I'm really like Jenga, you know, I'm, I'm playing with balance. And um, the, obviously, I'm, I'm really trying to play with this idea of the shapes balancing on top of each other. And, um, you know, is there equilibrium? Are these shapes holding, e you know, helping each other out? Is there a harmony or is there dissonance? And, um, well, I really don't like uh, synthetic looking colors and I don't like colors that are too harsh and too loud and um, and all of my colors are m pretty much all of them are mixed and I, I often tone down with even a little bit of brown mm -hmm. to bring a warmth and that softness in and so yeah definitely I mean it sounds maybe cliche to say living in Maine for 25 years that the natural world it really has an impact and but it's, it's what we all are enthralled with here, yeah. is just watching the seasons. And well, I take, I take paintings and image making really, really seriously. And um, I see them, like a lot of things that we do and make, it's a, it's a reflection of, of who you are and where you are. In watercolor especially, it's a real reflection of where you are at in that moment. And, um, and so, you know, I, I hope that you can see some gentleness and some patience in my work, and we certainly need a lot more of that in the world. Yeah. And in your painting, there are many forms, like the one just behind you with the two uh, upright forms and the, and the uh, lines of blue hanging from them and dangling down and so forth. People might say, what is that? <laughs> and what would you say to them saying that? This painting I did at the very beginning of the pandemic. It took me a long time. It looks like just a few marks, but it was weeks when, and it was just like I would make one little mark and one little mark, and I thought it was a real statement. It's just like, okay, this is isolation and, you know, uh, and distancing, and, you know, it all comes out in the painting. And so um, I think the other thing I'd like to speak to, though, is my work is abstract, but I'm really a symbolist. And there's a great tradition in painting, in art making, but in, in painting for sure, of symbolist painters. And so and maybe people don't even know there's a distinction between abstraction and symbolism. But 
it takes you into the world of myth and takes you into collective consciousness, Joseph Campbell, and things that we all see in our dreams. If you see a door, well, I've given you openings, and so I don't see I need to explain that away, you know. Well, Marcy, you began to tell me about these sketchbooks, which are really a big part of your whole practice. So maybe you could go through that a little bit also. Yeah, they're a really uh, important part, but also just so much fun to work in the books. And um, all sorts of things happen in my sketchbooks. I can play with different palettes, and who knows where all of these different things will end up in final paintings, but it's not really the point. When I'm working in the books, I'm I'm just on a small scale on my lap. A lot of these I did actually on the ship. I would be sitting on the ship um, outside and just making these little books. And um, I'm watching the way the watercolor behaves and I'm watching uh, how, how things bleed and how I can control the bleed. And I'm getting, as I said, ideas for a color palette. And um, so this is just something I started intuitively. I didn't even, it nothing, it turns out so many great things are not premeditated. So many of the great things we do are just not premeditated, and that's, this, that's how it was with the book. So I started early on with, um, this was a big blank watercolor book that my husband and my son gave to me as a gift. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how I was going to approach, at that point I just didn't know what to do, and I just started to stamp uh, the pages I well, cut, these are, all these are me, I cut, I cut, um, you know, I cut soft lino yeah. and I started making stamps because at the time I was um, teaching art at the Center for Maine Contemporary Art and we were making stamps mm -hmm. and I love stamping <laughs> and printing so I made these and then w the beauty of it is I could stamp a page and the next morning just fill it in and it always gave me, I'm sure there's some blank ones in here, it always gave me something, we'll see, I even did. <laughs> yeah, these are Sally Mann's children. Oh, <laughs> I just, really? Yeah. Um, so, the, um, it was just a, a way for, it was, this is just like free space, a playground, you know? Mm -hmm, yeah. This is sitting and looking out at um, Islesboro, and I just put pieces of the island in each one. So, here's a page that I stamped and didn't paint yet. But it became a real practice. And so, and then um, this one, which I was so excited about, led to this book cover for the New England Review. And when this all happened, I realized there was real potential in, in making these stamped pages as really the art form. And this is one of the first series of watercolor that I really created as an intentional series. Mm -hmm. And so these are all... These have more of the elements that you work with now. Like yes, exactly. It all started happening, though. It really all comes back to the, mm -hmm. the sketchbooks. And that's where you know, it's just a kind of bubbly um, kind of science lab and art lab where you can play and have beautiful accidents. Like this is one of my favorite pages and this, this kind of smear that becomes because you're upset but then you have to work with it and incorporate it into the page. Mm -hmm. You make it clear that you respect your own um, play ability. So in other words, you need, as an artist, you really need to say, this is worth my time. Mm. I don't care if people like it or don't like it. Mm -hmm. I'm doing this for me. I'm going to make this play for, with myself happen so that I can learn something about stuff, about stuff and my emotions and everything. Yeah. So you're, it's a growth process. It's a growth process, and you're speaking about a space of beginner's mind. I mean, I have it, your voice comes back to me. It's like a mantra about how, you know, just a shape can, can evoke and provoke something in us, mm -hmm. and um, and it should never be a boring shape. It should never be automated. And it, it was also, um, I think, it was also a reminder of that. You know, that just to to not be working in an automated way. It's mm -hmm. too easy to just draw a circle, or because we know that. But trying to find the shape, trying to really find it, and watch the paint flow, and then letting it, and then you've got a new shape that mm -hmm. you can't even imagine. I'm going to stop the recording.